Hi, welcome to the InterAccess channel, InterAccess.io. Today I want to talk about something like replacing risk. And this idea came about because I saw a tweet from a guy I know, Hugh Carp. Hugh is the founder of Nexus Mutual, which is a smart contractor insurance protocol, a DeFi insurance protocol. And what he said basically in this tweet is, so much of DeFi, so much of decentralized finance is replacing credit risk with smart contract risk. Now that little statement, and, and look, Hugh admits that that is a that, that's very very much an oversimplification, but it is actually true of so much in crypto and DeFi. And I wanted to unpack that a little bit because it's actually a a really big statement, something we need to think about in relation to how we invest, how we look at DeFi, how we look at the risks we see in decentralized finance versus other other parts of traditional finance. So let's unpack that statement. We're replacing credit risk with smart contract risk. Okay, so let's figure out what these both are. So one, credit risk. Credit risk, there's so much of credit risk inside the traditional finance system. Of course, credit, debt, it is, it is allowing people to borrow money. And more so than that, credit risk is, is about the risk that you will not perform, that you will not do what you said you were going to do. You won't live up to the contract that we had in place, and therefore you're going to default. Either you don't pay me back, you don't do the work, whatever it might be. But in purely financial standpoints, is you won't pay me back the money. Of course, debt is really what makes the financial system go. And I'm talking when I say the financial system, I mean the world economy is so much based on debt. It is the fact that I have money, and I've denoted it, of course, in dollars. It could be denoted in any currency. I have money sitting over here not being used. So it's earning basically zero, and I get it over here to someone who we will call Ron, who can take this same money and he can use it for his we'll call it a business, it might be for something else, it might be to buy a home, whatever. He can utilize this same money and he might be making, uh, let's call it 15% on that money. Here it was making zero, here it's making 15, but he needs my money and what do I do? I let him borrow it and in return he pays me some percent and we'll call that, I don't know, say 8% or something, and Ron gets to keep the other 7%. That is how so much of the economy is done. It's taking money that is sitting dormant, that is not being used, and putting it to use with someone else that can, that can get more use out of it, that can make it more efficient. That is what so much of debt is. That is what so much of the economy is. Without that, our economy doesn't move nearly as fast. If everyone just hoards their money and doesn't help out other people, if everyone hoards their money and doesn't help out but it is not able to utilize that money efficiently, there's only so many things I can do with my own money that don't involve investing in others or investing in other businesses or letting others use it. When I put money into the bank, so if I take my money, this is essentially what banks do, right? And I put my money into a bank. The bank is then going to lend it out to Ron because it doesn't do any good sitting on the balance sheet of the bank or sitting in the vault of the bank. It does no good. They're going to lend it out. This is fractional reserve banking. This is the bank saying, Adam, we're going to take your money. We're going to notate that it's your account, but we're not going to have that money sitting in a vault that's earmarked as Adam's money. We're going to get it out to someone else, and the bank is going to keep most of this. They're going to they're going to give me like at, at this moment like 0.01 percent, and they're going to charge Ron maybe you know, 8% depending on the riskiness and they're going to uh, make the difference because they're the ones going around. They're the ones taking on some of that risk because if he doesn't repay them, they still have to give me my money. Okay, so they're taking on some of that risk. So this is the credit risk. The credit risk is what if Ron does not repay the loan? That is credit risk. Okay, and there's so much of that in the world. That's why it is sometimes so hard to get a loan. It is hard to get a mortgage. It is hard to get a business loan. You almost have to already have the money in order to get a loan. That's why if you the, the, the loans that you get that don't require any sort of collateral, which are essentially credit cards, have such high interest rates because the bank has given them to you. The credit card company has given you these loans, but they haven't secured anything from you. So if you can't pay it back, the only thing they can take from you is what, what we call your credit, is this 
feeling that this idea you have this credit score that is your ability to later get more debt. It's your ability to later borrow more money. That's what they can get you with. So there is this credit risk and this happens of course multiple times, millions of times all over the world every day. So the bank takes my money, lends it to Ron and, and maybe is charging him 8% because it's a, it's a business loan. And they've had to see that Ron can then repay that loan somehow based on either the assets of the business or the income that the business will generate or something. But they're gonna probably have some sort of claim on the assets or claim on the income if Ron doesn't or can't pay. Just like when I get a mortgage, and if I cannot pay my mortgage, the bank gets to take my house. They get to foreclose on my house, sell it, and maybe I will get the, the leftovers if, if they are able to get anything above and beyond what I owed on the house. They take that as what's called collateral. And we all know this, but I'm explaining it in very, very basic terms to make sure that we step through this, in, this one statement made by Hugh that is actually has huge, far-reaching effects. So the most of the financial ecosystem is based on debt and so many of the rules and the regulations and the guardrails and everything we've created in the traditional finance system is based on that credit risk. It's based on what happens if he doesn't pay, what happens to the bank, what happens to my money. Of course, I'm going to get my money because the bank has FDIC insurance. So this is in the US. If the bank runs out of money because people are not paying them back, the federal government will step in and they say, look, we will ensure that the bank can give Adam back his money because we want Adam to feel safe. So they've offloaded some of that risk. The bank, of course, says, look, we're only able to take so much risk from some people. So they might, most of their businesses that they lend to might be at a lower interest rate, but it's probably people who have, you know, $10 million invested in that or $10 million deposit in that bank or have a CD or something. Or they're able to um, put a lien on the assets of the company, whether it's land, property, manufacturing equipment, oil and gas reserves, whatever it might be, they're able to put a lien on something. And when they do that, they go, we feel comfortable enough with the collateral that we will go ahead and lend you the money. Now, the problem is collecting on that collateral is not always the easiest thing. Foreclosing on a home is not an easy process. Foreclosing on a business, foreclosing on property of a business, manufacturing equipment, oil and gas equipment, whatever it might be, is not always an easy process but it, it, it's something that is a pain for the bank, which is why they don't want to do it, which is why anyone who's lending money does not want to go through that, and they want to make sure that they've taken into account as much of the credit risk as possible. That's why you, you often hear things like, one, people who have money don't necessarily need to borrow, but they do it anyway, because they can, because it's so much easier. But those who really could use the money to borrow for something really, you know, a new business or something, they don't always, they're not always able to borrow it. And the reason is because they have an established credit, because the business that they're starting doesn't necessarily have anything that can, that can be used as collateral. And there's not a very good way to use the future income from a business as collateral. Okay, so you can say, man, this person's going, might have a really great business, but until I see those cash flows start, I'm not going to lend money. The company Stripe recently has started lending money to some of their users because Stripe gets to see what the cash flows are like. And they say, we will lend you $10,000 or $25,000 or $100,000 because we see your cash flow. We see the money that's coming in because we process the transactions. And as you process more transactions, we're going to keep some of that money to pay back this loan. That is credit risk. What we've done in the DeFi world is we've taken quite a bit of that and, and we've said, look, we can take that collateralization, we can take the, those assets, and, and they are digital assets now. We can take those and wrap, what we call wrap them up in a smart contract, right? So, so if I'm going to borrow in the DeFi world, for instance, and I talk a lot about borrowing, but it, it could be you know, any other kind of financial activity. But if I'm going to borrow in the DeFi world, I might, and it's very basic, I might take my ETH, put it into a smart contract uh, somewhere like uh, Compound, and I'm using this as collateral, and I'm borrowing, you know, something like USDC or DAI, right? Or obviously, at its, at its very core, this is what Maker does, right? Maker allows me to deposit some sort of asset, some sort of crypto asset, digital asset, and I get back DAI for that. That's how DAI is even created. 
So this is at, a, at its core. And what they say is, look, th this, whether it's compound or maker, is a protocol. This is just smart contracts that say, if your collateral gets below a certain point, we're just going to liquidate it. And we can do that as smart contracts. We don't have to ask for permission. It's not like foreclosing on a home. We can just take your, your digital assets like that because you have given us permission to do that via the smart contract. And when that happens, we can liquidate right away. They have essentially taken out the credit risk. Okay, they've completely, they, not completely, they've very much eliminated the credit risk by saying once this ETH, if I put in you know, $2,000 worth of ETH, for instance, $2,000 worth, not 2,000 ETH, and I get back 1,000 die, and I have a two to one collateralization ratio and I need to have one and a half to one, when this gets to say $1,400 worth of ETH, it's gonna get liquidated. Okay, they're going to take my ETH, I can no longer get it back. We have taken out so much of the credit risk with DeFi because of collateralization. Now, what that doesn't do, and we'll talk about this in another time, is that makes it really hard to collateralize, you know, say tokens that represent real world assets. So that's gonna kind of be the next step. But for crypto, for digital assets, this is what we can do. We can just say, look, if you wanna deposit these, you can deposit them and borrow something out. Now, replacing it with smart contract risk, what does that mean? Well, what, what kind of risk am I taking here? I am taking, and, and they are taking, the risk that this can be hacked or exploited. I'm taking on this risk. This can be hack, hacked or exploited. So someone can come in here, exploit or hack, and start draining ETH out of these wallets or out of these smart contracts. In which case, I can't go get my ETH back because it's not there anymore. Because again, there's no 800 number. There's no company here that I can call and say, give me my ETH back. So if I've deposited my ETH and borrowed DAI, or I, I've deposited in here as a liquidity provider, and I'm providing liquidity for others, so I'm providing my ETH to Compound, and then someone else is borrowing USDC, or someone else is borrowing that ETH on the other side, and someone comes in and hacks this or exploits it and takes the ETH out or takes the USDC out, I can no longer go back and get it because it's not there anymore and there's no one to call for, you know, to, to get that money from back from that exploit. So what we've done is we've taken we've taken out the credit risk because we can collateralize, we can collateralize using smart contracts, uh, using decentralized finance and these protocols, but we've moved that into smart contract risk. So now I have the risk if I'm depositing my money there that these can get hacked, I can lose my money, I can't go get it out. So we've just moved risks around. And when I'm an investor, that that is what all of investment is. It is just, um, it, it is just looking at the risk and looking at my potential reward, looking at my goals, my needs, and going, does this fit? Does this fit my risk and reward scenario? What kind of reward am I getting from this? Why am I doing this? If I'm getting a 20% uh, annualized reward, 20% annualized uh, gain here, what am I risking? Am I risking everything? Am I risking 100% of my money to get 20%? Maybe that's too much of a risk. And remember, risk is all perception, and it's all based on the, the experience and the understanding of the user. So. I personally have been dealing with crypto and DeFi for a while. I understand wallets and private keys. I understand how to look at smart contracts a bit and kind of understand which ones I feel are viable and how much risk I'm willing to take. So for some protocols that have been around a while that I feel have been audited, I know how to use my private keys and wallets, I might want to get 20% on my money and I feel like they're a pretty good risk. I don't feel like those are going to get hacked or exploited. I don't feel like my money is going to go to zero, but there are plenty of other people who go, I'm not going to do that because I could lose it all in one day. There's no way I'm going to take on the risk of losing 100% of my money to make 8 or 10%. And we hear that quite a bit. It's all a matter of perception, understanding, education, knowledge, all of all of those things. But what Hugh is saying, because he he is the founder of Nexus Mutual, and there are other insurance protocols, but Nexus Mutual was kind of the, the first big one, is what if we can take away some of that smart contract risk as well? We can insure that. So if I'm going to deposit quite a bit here and I go, look, I feel like this, and, and maybe it's not compound or maker, maybe it's some new uh, 
protocol out here, you know, that's brand new that I haven't really heard of. How much am I willing to risk? Well, if I'm if I'm going to put, we'll call it ten thousand dollars worth of ETH or USDC or something in here to try to earn 12 or 14 percent, whatever it might be. But I go, man, this thing, you know, I don't really know as much about this. It doesn't have as much of a track record. But if I can buy some insurance, I can spend maybe 3 percent of, of this, so $300 annually to make sure that if this gets exploited, if this gets hacked, if someone drains it out, that I am then made whole. Well, in my mind, I've taken out so much of that smart contract risk. I've, com I've almost completely eliminated credit risk because I know this is 100% or 150% collateralized. And if I can take out the smart contract risk by paying 3%, then to me it's a good deal. Because now, instead of making you know 14%, maybe I'm making 11 or, or 12%, but I know that I'm, I'm fairly certain that even if there's an exploit or a hack, I'm still going to get made whole. So again, we're replacing a lot of credit risk with a lot of smart contract risk, but we have also created ways to eliminate or lessen or lower some of that smart contract risk. And of course, we've done that in a decentralized way through protocols like Nexus Mutual and, and InsureAce and some others that um, actually provide smart contract cover. So it's another form of insurance. Just like the FDIC helped insure it against credit risk, which by the way, the credit risk that most of us in the world were not able to guard against is what caused the financial crisis. It, it's what caused the Great Recession that that there were there there were so many banks that were making so much money giving out loans to people for their homes, and they just assumed that people were going to keep making payments on their homes, and the rest of us in the world didn't realize what was going on with banks basically lending to each other and to each other and to each other and packaging those up and lending to each other more. We didn't realize all that was was going on. That's essentially what caused the the, the financial crisis. So now what we've said in DeFi is we can actually get rid of mo a lot of that credit risk by using smart contracts, by using collateralization ratios, by using these protocols, and we've created a new risk. And we have, to, we have to decide how much of that risk are we willing to take. Can we insure some of it? If I can insure some of it, how much does it cost to insure it? Does that lower my reward so much that it's now not worth it? Or does that lower my reward just to the point where I go, look, I still like this reward. Now I've eliminated the credit, most of the credit risk. I've eliminated most of the smart contract risk. I'm good with it. That is what is happening so much in decentralized finance. And of course, the next step, as I said, was how do we get real world assets? How do we get um, property? How do we get luxury goods? How do we get businesses that are then tokenized and able to u be used as, as collateral where we can we can be lending to those institutions, lending to those companies or, or people, businesses, whatever it might be, and we somehow eliminate the credit risk. And the problem there is now you're going to have to figure out a way to, to actually collect. You're, if, if someone defaults, you're actually going to fi have to figure out a way to go actually take their property, to actually own that property, own that collateral if they do not fulfill their end of the bargain if they do not pay back the loan. And if we can do that, we can open up this whole new world of credit now that, that effectively works all over the globe. And then we're going to have to be able to insure that even more. And if we can do that with smart contract coverage or, or some sort of insurance like that, we have essentially moved from credit risk to smart contract risk. And then we can move the risk on down the line and say, we're going to insure it. And now those in the decentralized world that are providing that insurance, now they're going to be at risk. And we, we essentially just keep moving the risk on down the line and down the line and down the line because somewhere someone is not going to pay their bills and something is going to get exploited and hacked. And we just all have to see where where we're willing to take risks and where we're willing to get rewards. So hope you enjoyed this. Hope it made sense. Uh, this is from a, a tweet from Hugh Carp of Nexus Mutual where he says most of DeFi is just replacing credit risk with smart contract risk. Uh, visit us on our YouTube channel. Uh, please subscribe. Visit us on our website, interaxis.io. Follow us on Twitter at interaxis8. We'll see you in the next video.